Hello everyone, my name is Kathy Bollinger, Managing Director of York County Community Foundation. It's Embracing Aging Initiative. We're a charitable organization located in York, Pennsylvania, and we're passionate about creating a community that is inclusive and equitable to all ages. Embracing Aging's work is supported by donor Anna Gardner, who gifted her estate over 110 years ago. She wanted to make certain that our residents could have the best quality of life possible as we age, and we're honored to carry on her legacy. Too often negative thoughts and, and words about aging gets in the way of us having the best quality of life. So Embracing Aging is hosting a series of online sessions where we invite people in to share their stories, tips, ideas, challenges, concerns all around aging, but that we wanna use the information that we gather and glean from our time together to inspire us to think more positively about our own aging and older adults as a group, but also for all of us to work together to make certain that our community is not only a great place to grow up, but a great place to grow older. You can learn more about our work at embracingaging.org. And if you're on Facebook, we ask that you follow us at why CCF Embracing Aging. Today's session's being recorded. We will have uh, a few uh, scripted questions that I'll be asking our guests and then we'll open it up to everyone in the remaining minutes of our time together to, for you to ask your questions. If you have any thoughts or comments along the way, you're welcome to put them in the chat box. And now I'd like to introduce you to our guests today. I'm very um, happy that they're joining us. Uh, we have Michael Gingrich and Tom Caden from an organization based in Harrisburg called Someone to Tell It To. And you know, life can be hard sometimes. And over the past 12 months, especially, life has been very hard. And you might have had someone come to you who wanted to share their story, and, or you might have wanted to turn to someone to talk to. And today's session is all about helping us build our listening muscle, our uh, compassionate listening muscle. So welcome, Michael. Welcome, Tom. We're, we're glad to be here. Thank today. you. Thank you. Great. Grateful to be here. Well, we're grateful to have you. So let's go ahead and start. I mentioned that you have an organization called Someone to Tell It To. How did that begin? Yeah, well, I'll start. <laughs> the name of our organization, we'll start with that, is Someone to Tell It To. And it comes from an Australian author who once said that someone to tell it to is one of the fundamental needs of human beings. Mm -hmm. And we say that we really believe that because we've experienced it ourselves. Uh, Michael, in our friendship and our relationship together, uh, which started maybe 15 years ago, um, we just became dear, dear friends and, and realized that we both had this yearning to, to listen to each other's stories, to be fully present, to be, uh, especially as males, to be vulnerable and authentic and honest and open in a relationship. And we just realized that there, were, there was a world of people that didn't have that type of a connection in their lives. And so we, we started to see this global need and we wanted to do something about it. We've also realized that there um, is an epidemic of loneliness that exists, not just in the United States, but around the world. And um, increasingly, more and more people have fewer and fewer friends, fewer and fewer people with whom they can confide in uh talk really talk to be open with and vulnerable with and we wanted to do something about that and even with the 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 onset of uh, of technology and and all the ways that we can connect with one another technologically that which is fantastic and we embrace that and 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 feel that it's it's here to stay and there are ways that can be used on the other hand, at the same time, we are less connected emotionally and relationally with one another mm. around the world. And we, 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 we believe that we have to do something about that because that's, that's not good. We're as human beings, we are made to connect with one another. And when we don't, mm. and particularly in this last year, when we've all had to be distanced and be isolated in so many ways, connections have been even more difficult and there is a lot of uh, ptsd associated with that and as people are trying to navigate through this 
this this time when life has just changed dramatically for for everyone. I really like how your vision focuses on um, everyone matters and everyone deserves to be heard and really working to diminish loneliness. I, I just, I love that vision. I think that that's so important. Another thing that I really like is the titles that the two of you have, Chief Encouragement Officers. So how did you land on those titles and how do they impact your work? <laughs> Well, um, we landed on that title because that's what we want to be. We, 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 you know, we want to be, we want to be, we try to be very relational with people and the people on our team who work with us and help to train other people to listen, help to listen to other people as we do. Um, and, you know, and, and all the other aspects of, of running a nonprofit that are, that are necessary. We just want to be uh, leaders who give permission and, and encouragement to people, permission to be their best, permission to do what they love to do, uh, permission uh, to, to know that they they that they're, they're valuable, and and so we want to encourage them in that, just as we we want to encourage everybody with again with the values that we share that everybody does matter. One of the things that we do with every person who reaches out, we call everybody someone. So everybody on this call is someone, I'm someone, Michael, someone, we're all someone, someone who has a story that needs to be told. And we realized that when people reach out for the very first time, it's a really, it's a vulnerable thing to do, to ask for help, to say, I'm stuck right now and I need some help. Uh, I'm, I'm in a difficult spot and I don't know what to do and I don't even know who to turn to. So one of the messages that we often convey with everybody that, that reaches out for the very first time is we're, we're very proud of you because that's a, that's a, that's a hard thing to do. And it, it's a vulnerable thing. And, and yet we know that this is where healing begins. It begins by being heard and taking that first step. The first step is that we've all heard is always the hardest. So when people take that first step, it's a, it's a meaning, we call it like a sacred moment, a transcendent moment when that occurs. And so we, we try to, we just try to encourage people because we all need to be encouraged and affirmed. Thank you, Tom and Michael, you know, um, so recognizing how difficult it can be for people to take that step and, and show their vulnerability, vulnerabilities. Um, when someone reaches out to us, it's really important that we honor them to be the best type of listeners that we can be. So what kind of tips do you have to help us to build our compassionate listening muscle? Mm. Well, first it is that we do, we do tell everyone we're very proud of you for reaching out. We say that we know that it's difficult. We know that it takes a lot of courage. We know that, um, that it's, that it's just hard. And so I think just hoping to put people at ease in that, in that way is, is a first step to um, enabling them to feel more comfortable, to feel more safe. Uh, we also are willing and, and do meet people wherever they want to be met meaning that um, we, ha we have an office, but it's so rare that we've ever, in 10 years that we've been doing this, we've rarely met anyone in our office. People are more comfortable meeting in a coffee shop or a restaurant or in a, on a day like today, we're happy to meet anybody outside in a park <laughs> or to walk with them or, or whatever, whatever it's going to take. We've met people in their homes. We've gone to hospital rooms and, and, and listen to people. We, we also don't always listen to people um, in person. We, we will meet people, uh, we will talk with people over the phone if that's what's going to be safest for them. We'll do it through Zoom like we're doing right now. We've done, done a lot of that this, this past year. Uh, 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 there are some people who simply have emailed us or texted us and to, to kind of unburden themselves and tell us their story. So we are willing to meet people wherever they are most likely to open up and to share and to to feel safe sharing what they need to share so it's those kinds of things that we think help 
to make it easier uh, for people to, to, to want to do that. In fact, we can tell you a quick story. One of our first the first interview we ever did was on WITF uh, public radio station here in Harrisburg, and we we did the we did the interview and the interviewer um, was on Radio Smart Talk, and he Scott Lamar the, the the host asked us about shame because we had recently written a blog about shame and he'd read it he'd obviously done his homework and he wanted to to talk about that and so we did. After the interview was over, we received an email from a 68 year old woman uh, in who we ultimately learned was writing from Lancaster County. And she she had been driving her car. She heard the interview. She wrote that she pulled over to the side of the road with tears running down her face because she'd been looking her whole life for someone who would listen to her story without judgment and not cause shame. And she said, I think after listening to you, I found those people. Wow. And would you would you listen to me? We immediately wrote back and said, absolutely. And how would you like to do it? We can meet face to face. And we offered all the various ways. And she said, I would I would just like to email you. And she said, because my story, in essence, my story is so difficult that if I if I met you face to face, I'd want you to like me. But if, but if I met you face to face, I wouldn't tell you the truth. And so she knew that she could only tell us the real story by email. Wow. Wouldn't have been safe doing it where we could see one another. So we learned from that, definitely learned from that, the value of offering all kinds of different ways for people to feel comfortable. Thank you for yeah. sharing that story. Tom, any other tips? <laughs> yeah, I'll come back to your question too, just based on that interaction. I, I think just safety, creating safety for people, meeting people where they are is an invaluable gift because when you're about to share something vulnerable, you need to just feel completely comfortable and confident that you're going to be ultimately loved regardless of whatever you share, um, that people aren't going to run for the hills when when you say something hard. Um We'll give you just a couple, hopefully a couple helpful tips here. Uh, we have a 10 tips handout that we offer to organizations for $10 for individuals that uh, we can we can put in the chat box here. Um, you can just email us at info at someone to tell to.org. But a couple tips that might be helpful for you is one of the things that we love to convey, and we actually just want to shout this message from the rooftops, is that listening ultimately starts with what you believe about people that everyone has worth, that everyone's story matters and needs to be told. Because we would make the argument, if you don't believe that, are you really going to listen? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Mm -hmm. So you have to believe that every single person that you're interacting with at any given moment has worth and has value, that their story matters. Mm -hmm. Second thing is making others feel as if they are the most important person in your life at a specific moment. One of our heroes who we quote and write about all the time in both of our first two books and, and future books is the late Fred Rogers from Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. And he would always say that whoever he was speaking with, he wanted that person to feel as if that person was the most important person in his life at that moment. So if he was on the call with somebody from another state, that person was the most important person. If he was home with his two sons, those two sons were the most important people in his life at that moment. Lastly, um, and these are, these are tips that we go into uh, greater detail in our training program, which is available to groups and organizations. Uh, we love to get into organizations and, and lead you through a, a training program. But the last one is just being not judgmental and not trying to fix people's problems, but to journey with them to find the solutions for themselves. Uh, oftentimes in the talks that we give, and it's hard to do on Zoom, we'll, we'll just, we'll ask everyone, how many of you are fixers? And it's amazing how many hands will often go up because most of us just are hardwired to want to fix people's solution, find solutions. And oftentimes there are a lot of issues in life that are not fixable. Uh, we like to give an example of somebody who has a cancer diagnosis that's ongoing for two years. 
that situation is not fixable. I mean, certainly there's uh, necessary medicine that, that can be offered and is, uh, but they need ultimately somebody who's just going to journey alongside of them. And we've, we've listened to people for years because of, of situations that right now, we just got a text yesterday from a woman locally. Uh, her husband has brain cancer and he's had brain cancer for four years. It's not going away but she needs the ongoing emotional support that we can provide. So we, 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 we journey with her. So those are just a couple of helpful tips that, that hopefully will help you uh, as you interact, interact with family members and team members. But we have, we have a lot more that we could offer, but we'll just uh, whet your appetite here today with those three. I'd like, to, I'd, like to, I'd like to build on um, what, what Tom's mention of, of Fred Rogers, because he really is a hero of ours. And, um, he used to, when he was living, he carried around in his pocket on a piece of paper, a quote that a social worker had given him one time, and he believed in it very much. And in, in, in essence, I'm paraphrasing it. He said, but you can't help, it said, you can't help but love someone once you know their story. Mm -hmm. And when you hear somebody's story, I mean, it's really easy to, to look at people and judge them, disagree with what they do, what they say, who, who they are. But when you hear in greater depth about their life and their experience, you can begin to see, even if you disagree with someone, why perhaps they believe what they believe or feel what they feel or are who they are. And that doesn't always make it right, you know, if it's something that, that you, you, again, you, you just don't agree with about them, but, but it gives you perspective. Mm -hmm. And when you have perspective and you know some, you know, the backstory, you can appreciate, at least appreciate people more and maybe respect them and, and have an understanding of, of maybe where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And that, that really makes a difference in 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 um, the way we listen and how we, we we treat one another and and certainly we all know that this world is a divided place and um there's just a lot of divisions among us but we try to focus on our common humanity and when you do that we realize there's so much more we have in common than what separates us and and that helps us that helps helps us all to have better relationships Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I noticed that we're at 1020 and I want to make certain that our guests have opportunities to ask questions. And I know Stephanie, uh, I think, has a question. So I want to let her uh, go ahead and ask. Um, and then if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll go into our last question. But this is wonderful work that you're doing. And I know it's very meaningful. And let me hear from those of you who are with us today. Stephanie? Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, I've been off camera. I'm working, so I'm doing two screens here. But um, uh, this conversation is just so, so this is such a good conversation. And I thought the statement that uh, Tom made regarding, you know, if I was in person, I wouldn't tell you the truth. Oh, that was just so powerful. And just to be able to write, write that down, to have, you know, that freedom to express it in that way. And I totally relate to that. But I guess my question is, when you talk about um, wanting to fix things and just being there to journey along with them. I just want uh, some suggestions on how do you just, how do you not want to fix things and just, I know listening is very important and a very important part of that, but when you're journaling, jur well, journaling too, yeah, but journeying <laughs> alongside of someone experiencing this, how do you just journey with them and know when to lend support when not to when you know because yes like you said we all want to fix things make it better so if you can help me with any of that i'd be grateful <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question and it's it's one of the hardest things to do to be honest it's we're not pretending that's easy because we, we, yeah, we want to make, we, I think we're naturally inclined to want to want to make things better for people and, and to, uh, but I think one of the things we've realized in all the listening we've done is that most people, most of the time actually know the answer to what needs to happen. 
a lot of it is giving them permission. We mentioned it before, that's part of the encouragement part of it, giving people permission to explore the answer. And I, the other the other thing is most of us don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> so even when, you know, even if we know the answer, you know, if I, it, it, if someone tells, even if I know, okay, what I should do, but somebody tells me, you must do this, you need to do that. There tends to be a natural resistance to that from most of us. And so part of the reason that we don't try to, we don't tell people what to do is because we know that the answer for it really to matter, for it really to work, needs to come from within. We can, we can affirm it, but so we, we, we walk with people and let them actually, as the more people talk, usually, the more, and the more we ask, we hope good questions, it draws them out more and more that they begin to see the solution themselves. And at that point, our, if we do any fixing, it's like saying, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and and in the, in the sense that we, again, encourage them, give them permission to try that, to try whatever that that solution might be. I don't know if that's that's helpful, but it it's it, it's not a cut and dry kind of thing, but it's a it's it's a matter of being patient enough with people, asking some the right questions that, 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 that can draw them out, helping them to feel safe and comfortable, they will begin on their own to understand what they need to do and, and really believe, begin to believe in it. Tom, help, tell here if you can add to that. You're muted, Tom. Just, oh, yeah, you just to put a finer point on that, I think just we find a lot of freedom in knowing that we don't always have to have the solution. And, and we, we, you may have heard this phrase, but there's, there's this, this phrase that a lot of researchers have called like a Messiah complex that we have, that we have to somehow save people from their problems. And it's just, that's not, we, we probably can make the argument. That's not what we're here to do. Um, you know, we're here to support one another. And in fact, we call ourselves compassionate listeners because the word compassion, the root word compassion, most of us don't know this. We throw that word around a lot, but actually the root word for compassion in the Latin is pati cum, which means to suffer with. Mm -hmm. And most of us don't like to suffer um, alongside somebody because it's, it's uncomfortable. But, um, you know, I'm just going to throw this out there too. One of the things that's really unique about our work you know, because we don't fall into a traditional model. We, we, we're not a, a counselor, counseling service. We're not, a, we don't offer therapy. Um, we, 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 do, we do all of our listening in pairs. So we send all of our team members out in pairs. So when we go into an organization, for example, we were recently in a senior community locally supporting the nursing staff as a result of the COVID trauma that they've experienced. We've gone in and and, um, and, and all of our listeners met with the, the nursing staff in pairs, and there's just power in that. There's power in numbers, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very unique, but it works. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions from our participants today? Maggie? Um, kind of question, comment. Um, I, I love what you're doing, first off. That is amazing, um, because we don't have enough people out there that can, that will be willing to walk that journey. And whether you, my thought is whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, my two words I always keep in mind is being present. Exactly. Because if you're present, then you can listen. And there is no bigger gift than one can give to each other than walking that journey. And I just uh, wanna thank you for what you do and uh, I want to learn more about it because I just, what a gift you're giving to everyone. Thank you for doing it. We, we, need, we need to, uh, well, I, we see that this is being recorded. We need that recording of what you just said because of, <laughs> that, that really, um, it's, we, we appreciate that very much. And we believe you're absolutely correct in, in, in being present. Presence is, that's one of the things we try to teach in, in our training about how to be present with one another and not be distracted. And, um, and that's also why we, we send people out in pairs because 
we're stronger together, we can be more present together. And if one of us is mind wanders, we hope that the other one's there, you know, <laughs> is present and, you know, that we're covering ourselves a little bit better um, to be more present uh, with, with the person or people to whom we're listening. I like you doing that. Uh, when I did chaplaincy again in, in Baltimore, one of the chaplains was told by our new director, she's an introvert, an extrovert. I was, I mean, I, she was the introvert. I was the extrovert. And she was concerned about how our visits were. So she and I decided to go and do our rounds together. And my uh, thing was, if you talk too much, kick me. <laughs> uh, kick me. If I talk too much, kick me. If you don't talk enough, I'm going to give you that evil eye. So it was kind of fun to watch each other, how we, you know, handled the situation. Yeah. It, was, it was a, a learning for, for both of us. That's great. Yeah. Other questions? The most I sat with somebody in silence. <laughs> I'm sorry, Maggie. Other questions for Tom and Michael? Can you share with us, Tom and Michael, what can we do if we're looking for someone to share our story to? Um, what, are, what advice do you have to give us uh, to, number one, find a person that maybe we can share with, but number two, to have the courage to do that? Well, one of the researchers that we quote often in our writing and speaking is, is the researcher Brene Brown, and you can find some of her YouTube. She, she's uh, the most, one of the most watched TED Talks ever in history. Uh, she talks extensively about vulnerability, so we quote her often, but you know, she ultimately says that vulnerability is the willingness to show up and let ourselves be seen. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do because you're trusting yourself, your story to somebody else. But that's why uh, we would probably make the argument that listening ultimately starts with vulnerability um, because it's, it's somebody being vulnerable, putting themselves out there. But that's where uh, we would probably also, an inverse of that is that vulnerability starts with good listening. Because if you, if you don't have somebody who's willing to enter into some hard things with you and listen with compassion, you're probably not going to have a whole lot to say much, much further. Um, but we would probably just say, don't be afraid to share the truth of your insides. I mean, generally speaking, we all, we all enjoy talking about ourselves. But again, you can't expect to receive what you don't offer yourself. So thank you. That's kind of a golden advice. rule. <laughs> Great advice. Thank you. Well, everyone, I, I want you to know, again, the name of Michael and Tom's organization is Someone to Tell It To and is the website someone to tell it to dot org that's correct you got it yes. that's the website. Uh, so you can check out their work and uh, we will be uh, sharing the recording of today's session on our youtube page in a couple of weeks and it will also be embedded in our next blog which will go out next friday so um, you can share it with others as well um, our next embracing aging session is on april 22nd it is with a, a man named alan dubs who has devoted over a thousand years of volunteering or thousand hours thousand years a thousand hours volunteering as a mentor in the york city school district and he is going to share with us the impact of that what inspired him to do that but how that has also impacted his aging and his outlook on, on life. So uh, please join us then. Huge thank you, Michael and Tom, for sharing today, for all that you're doing in the community and for everyone who joined us. We so appreciate that you took time to be with us this morning. And I wish everybody an Embracing Aging Day. Bye-bye, thank you.